Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to learn the two to four player game Seasons, designed by Regis Bonazé and published by Asmodee. The great sorcerers of the kingdom have gathered in the heart of the forest to partake in the tournament of the Twelve Seasons. At the end of this three year competition, one will be crowned the Archmage. Will it be you? Join me at the table and let's learn how to play. To set up, place the game board in the center of the table and put a black cube on the one space here and here. These are the season's dice. You randomly select an amount of each color equal to the number of players plus one. We'll be setting up a two player game, so we'll select three of each color. These are placed by the side of the board that shares their color, and the rest of the dice you can return to the box. Each player collects a player board, a library two and three token, and the four sorcerer cubes in their color, placing one on the zero space here and here. This is the crystal track. Each player should put their remaining cubes on the zero space here and at the top of the board here. These are the energy tokens and they come in four different types that should all be placed within easy reach of the players. But for the purposes of this video, just to make it easier for me to move things around on the table, I'm going to return a portion of them to the box. Now shuffle and create a face down deck of these power cards dealing nine to each of the players. Each power card has a number on the bottom right here. They recommend for your first few games during this setup, you may choose to remove any numbered from 31 to 50, which have some of the game's more complex effects. Finally, give the youngest player the first player token. And that's the setup. In Seasons, players will be using the powers of the dice in combination with the cards they have to try to gain the most prestige possible. The game is played primarily over a series of rounds, but first, players must complete the prelude. Here, each player will look at the nine cards dealt to them and select one to keep, placing it face down in front of themselves and passing the other eight to the player on their left. Since the other player will have done the same thing, that means each player will now have eight cards in their hand. Again, they'll choose one to keep and pass the remaining seven, and you'll do this back and forth until each player has chosen nine cards. Players will go through the nine cards that they kept and organize them in any way they want into three piles of three cards each. One of the piles will be your starting hand, so you can collect that now. To each of the others, you'll assign either a library two or three token, which will determine the order in which you get to collect these cards later in the game, as we'll see. And keep in mind, although you're always allowed to look at the cards in your own piles, you can no longer change the contents of each pile. For your first games, if you'd like to simplify the prelude, the rules provide a starting hand of nine cards for up to four players, using the numbers found on the bottom of each one, as we saw earlier. You simply collect your set, and then immediately sort them into your starting three piles. Now the Tournament of Seasons officially begins, and from here, the game is played over a series of rounds where each player will take exactly one turn, starting with the first player and then going clockwise around the table. On the first player's turn in each round, they look at the color where the season marker is located and roll the dice matching that color. The game begins in winter, so we'll roll the blue dice. Now starting with the first player and going in clockwise order, each takes one of the rolled dice and puts it into their player board. This will leave one die unchosen that you'll save until the end of the round and we'll see how that works a little bit later. Now, again starting with the first player and going clockwise, each person will take their turn, during which they can perform a variety of different actions that will come from their season die, the cards in their hand, and their player board. Let's learn the different actions provided by the dice. The dice show a variety of different symbols that represent different actions that you can take. Four symbols in particular represent the different energy types, air, water, fire, and earth. Each of those symbols showing on the die that you chose allows you to collect those matching tokens from the supply. In this example, if I had this die, I'd be able to collect two of these air tokens. You place the collected tokens into these spaces known as the reserves of your player board. You can never have more than seven at any one time, so if you gain more than that, choose which ones to keep and return the rest to the supply before completing further actions. If there is a number showing on your die, you gain that amount of crystals, which are counted here on the crystal track. Simply move your marker the appropriate number of spaces. And if you go past the end of the track, 
Move this marker here to represent the crystals you've already collected and continue counting again from the bottom of the board. If you have the option to gain crystals or energy tokens from your die, those must be the first actions you take on your turn. The rest can be done in any order. If there is a star showing, you move your cube one space to the right on this track known as the summoning gauge, and we'll see the importance of this value a little bit later. If there is a card symbol on your die, draw one from the deck and either add it to your hand or discard it. There is no limit to how many that you can hold, but for every unplayed card in your hand at the end of the game, you'll lose five points of prestige. And if the power deck ever runs out, reshuffle any in the discard pile to form a new one. All of the previous actions we talked about must be taken at some point during your turn if your die shows any of them. However, this final action, the one represented by the border here, is referred to as transmutation, and its effects are optional. This allows a player to return to the supply any number of their collected energy tokens to collect, in return, a certain amount of crystals. The number of crystals you gain when transmuting a token are shown on the game board, and they will change depending on the season that you're currently in. For example, in winter, you can trade either a water or air for one crystal each, fire for two crystals, and each earth will provide you with three crystals. As long as your die shows the transmutation symbol, you can transmute any amount of energy you have during your turn. For example, I could choose to transmute this water for a single crystal, tracking it here, take other actions, and then later in the same turn, decide that I also want to transmute one of my earth tokens, providing me with another three crystals. Along with die actions, you may also play power cards from your hand, which is known as summoning them. But to do this, you'll need to ensure you have room for them based on your summoning gauge. The value under this token is how many power cards you can have in play at any one time. At the start of the game, this is at zero. So to be able to play even one card, you'll need to increase the gauge, which as you saw earlier, can be done using a die action with the star symbol. Once you have room for a power card, you need to be able to pay its cost. This is shown in the center here. Most will have an energy cost, which you pay by discarding the matching energy types from the reserve slots of your player board and returning them to the supply. Others will require you to pay a certain number of crystals, which you must be able to fully reduce from the amount you already have on the crystal track. Sometimes a cost will be based on the number of players in the game. For this power to be played in a two-player game, you'd have to pay three crystals, six crystals if there's three players, and with four players, you'd have to pay a total of nine. Once paid for, the power is then placed face up in front of you, and you should read the effect listed here to the other players. If the border has an orange coloring, this is a familiar, and its effect will apply to several players. If the card has a purple coloring to the border, it's a magical item, and its effects will benefit the owner. There are a variety of different effects, but three main ways in which they resolve. One showing this symbol have an effect that triggers only at the time the card has been summoned. A power with this symbol is a permanent effect that lasts as long as it remains in play. If you see this symbol, it means the effect will only trigger when the card is activated by its controlling player, who does this by first paying any cost listed with the effect. In this case, it says to discard four identical tokens. You then turn the card 90 degrees and then resolve its effect. Here it says gain 12 crystals. Once a card has been activated, it may not be used again until it's turned upright. We'll see how that works later, but this means you can potentially activate its effect several times over the course of a single game. No matter the effect, once played, the card stays in front of you and counts against the limit of your summoning gauge, even if its effect was a one-time use that is fully resolved. That said, you can summon any number of cards during your turn as long as you can pay for them and your summoning gauge provides you the room. There are two copies of every card, and if you have both in play, their effects are cumulative. There are 50 unique cards in the game, and their effects are printed right on the bottom, so I'm not going to go over each one individually. But if you do have any questions when you're playing, in the rulebook, they have a section for each card that you'll come across in case you do have any questions. Of the actions, the last we need to go over are the four bonus actions that you'll find listed here on the bottom of your player board. Each time you choose to take a bonus action, you can take a different one, or one that you chose previously, but either way, after each use, you move this token one space to the right. At the end of the game, you'll lose prestige equal to the value shown underneath of this token. And although you can use bonuses more than once on the same turn, you may only use, at most, three bonuses over the course of the entire game. And doing so would move your marker to the final space of this track. 
This bonus action allows you to trade two energy tokens from your reserve for any two of your choice from the supply. This action allows you to transmute during your turn and gain one bonus crystal for each token you transmuted. Using this action increases your summoning gauge by one, and this bonus action can only be used if your seasoned die is already allowing you to draw a card this turn, in which case you will draw two, keep one, and then discard the other. Once all players have taken a turn, the round ends. Remember, when each player was choosing one of the seasoned dice, one was left over. You now advance the seasoned token a number of spaces equal to the number of pips showing on that die. In this case, there's three dots, so we'll move forward. One, two, three. All the dice are now returned to the board. The first player token is passed to the left, and the next round begins with the new first player rolling the dice for the current season, which in this case is now in spring, so these green dice would be rolled. Also at the start of a new round, any rotated power cards are turned upright so that their controlling players can activate them again on their turn if they choose. Players will continue taking turns and completing rounds. On the round in which the season marker crosses over the 12 into a new year, you advance this token to the second year space, and each player adds to their hand all of the cards underneath of their Library 2 token. Play then continues as normal until this marker again crosses the 12 space. You'll advance to the third and final year, and players will collect the cards underneath of their Library 3 token. And now the rounds continue once more until this marker crosses the 12 one final time, and then the game ends immediately, and the players will total their scores. First, each crystal a player has earned counts as a point of prestige, so the purple player here has gained 72 points. Then, each card face up in your play area provides prestige equal to the value shown here in the top left-hand corner. So, for this player, a total of 30 points. You then lose points equal to the position of the token on the bonus track, in this case, minus 12 points, and an additional five points for each unplayed card remaining in your hand. So in this case, the player would lose another 10 points. The player with the most prestige points is the winner. If there's a tie, the tied player with the most power cards in play wins the game. And that's everything you need to know to play Seasons. If you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until next time, thanks for watching.